All right, we are here, we are so very queer, and we are going to talk about the most iconic relationship of the 20th century. Of course I am talking about Danny and Jamie from Bly Manor. I just feel like this relationship came at a time that I was so not expecting. First, I wanna talk about the fact that there was literally no promotion of a queer couple. Like, Bly Manor did like the opposite of queer baiting. It like, didn't say a word, and then was an epic queer love story. It, like, watching Hill House, I was so excited for Bly Manor because I, I loved Hill House. Primarily, of course, the story of Bly Manor, excluding Danny and Jamie's relationship, was also epic. But that, I just, no one prepared me. It, it, it took me until the third episode, the little, the, the touching moment, when I was like, oh, that's a little bit gay. It did take me that long to register that there was something going on. Because Victoria Pedretti, I mean, she showed up in You Season 2, that was the first thing I saw her in, and I was like, oh, Victoria, that's a little gay. Literally just ed every move that she made, every look that she gave, Around. I want to be careful about how I talk about this relationship because, because I believe that there is a lot beyond the fact that it was a gay relationship that we also need to praise. Regardless of the fact that it is queer representation, there is a lot going for it. I think Victoria said in an interview, I don't remember which, she was talking about how the relationship was one that wasn't overly romanticised or over the top in any way, they weren't each other's soulmates, they weren't each other's ride or die, they literally were taking it one day at a time, they were a naturalistic partnership who wanted the best for each other and supported each other. Especially comparing that to Rebecca and Peter and their relationship and what they were getting from each other and the rewards and the punishments and there was a whole system going on and that Typically, theirs is like to the extreme level of toxic, but that is typically how a love story is represented. Because a naturalistic, gentle love story is not usually something that anyone particularly wants to see because it's considered boring, you know, where's the drama? But that's what's so beautiful about this relationship, there was no drama, it was purely love. And that's what made it so brilliant. So the non-epicness of the relationship itself was actually what made it so epic in the end. And I think this also comes into play with the whole being queer. The fact that it wasn't made a big deal of, it wasn't over-sexualized, which a lot of queer relationships, especially female ones, are. All of the things that were missing, that weren't shown, that usually make a love story... I can't think of another word than epic, but I've said that like three times. The fact that two women could have such a naturalistic relationship in a TV show that is set in the 80s and also have this wonderful dynamic and also not be over-sexualized or over-romanticized or over anything -ized. That's what made it so special, was the subtlety. It was the looks that they would give each other. And those looks meant so much more than a sex scene of any kind. And there wasn't one. And I'm glad there wasn't one. I just have a lot of opinions, but I'm very much struggling with formulating them. So instead what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hop onto YouTube and I'm gonna watch some edits that people have made because I want to make myself depressed. I, I have, I've watched a couple. I haven't watched many because honestly, they just make me sad. I don't think their ending could have gone any other way. I think that she was always gonna save the kids. She was always gonna save Jamie or, you know, not kill her. So as sad as the ending is, it had to happen. So I'm not mad about the ending, I'm just sad. Here we go, we're diving in to the depths of hell. Ah! Oh, it's that! It's that look she gives when she's on the sofa. Like, how did I not realise this was gay before? I don't know. Ugh. The flower shop, what I would pay to go to that flower shop. It's the way they hold each other. Oh my god. And the fact that she's still waiting all these years later. And I think also Jamie was so brave throughout the entire thing. For Danny, obviously. And old Jamie just shows the turmoil of probably what she went through and the, the trauma. Ah! 
That was the, the end shot, the cruelest thing in mankind. I mean, that's not true, but... They were both so courageous in their own ways. Like, individually, regardless of relationship, solid characters. I'm not sick of you. At all. I'm actually pretty, pretty lovely, lovely, it turns that. out. Oh, that was a really poor accent, I'm so sorry. Wow! That kiss. That kiss. The chemistry was unreal, I will say. We have so many more. Like, look at the way she is supporting Danny throughout this. Like, literally, her rock. Danny. It was like they were each other's rocks. Oh my god, I'm going too deep. Jamie supported Danny, but at the same time, Jamie's entire world was Danny. So, when with her gone, there was like this emptiness. Which, to be fair, obviously it's a love story. And so, her waiting all those years later, like, that is sad and that is romantic. But at the same time, I am one of those people that thinks that relying on someone else in that kind of way does never lead to anything good. Especially when that person is dying, but I mean, she gave her her all anyway, which is the most courageous thing she could do because she, she knew she was going to live through that pain for the rest of her life. I, I just want to say, I am not a romantic. I am the complete opposite of romantic. I don't like romantic films. I am not a romantic person in my everyday life, but this hits differently, and I don't know why. <sighs> I'm so excited to go back to Love Quinn and Joe, whatever his name is, just killing people and living their toxic lives. It's so much easier to deal with in the old heart. Haunting of Blind Manor, but it's just Danny gay panicking over Jamie. That's what I want. <laughs> it's that first look. And the kids are like, little gay. <laughs> She's like, play cool, play cool. Oh. And that first kiss moment, it's literally like she couldn't wait any longer. She was like, I just need you right now. Right here, right now. <laughs> oh, they're so cute. They're both so soft. They have that desperation. You know that physical desperation that you sometimes witness? That that kind of that, I need to be close to you right now. I live my life through movies and TV shows. It's definitely not healthy. Oh my, just a couple more because I can't resist. Those most recent moments where she'd even been happy to have oh, Wow, this edit is something special. I am enjoying this. Oh! Oh my god, this is so sexually charged. I love that the wedding dress shop owner or fitter or whatever literally made her move while fitting her wedding dress. That's iconic, ladies and gentlemen. That is iconic behaviour. She is my favourite character, the wedding dress fitter. Oh, that's... This edit is something else. He's hot, though. Like, I will say, I also think that with the story of the, the dead boyfriend and, and kind of that that betrayal of her um, internalised homophobia. I thought that was a really nice touch. It wasn't overwhelming in the storyline, but I think for her character, it was a lot of what drove her for so long. And so having that relationship with Jamie obviously put not an end to it, but gave her validation. So that was an extra kind of bonus for her in terms of their relationship. And you felt that. You felt that relief from Danny, like she could breathe for the first time. She'd chosen someone to keep close to her that she could feel tired around. She'd chosen someone to keep close to her that she could feel tired around. Whoa! Why is my mind being blown? That's exactly it. They weren't going out of their way to be uber romantic and uber performative. They weren't putting on their best face. They were being themselves. That puts it exactly how I wanted to put it earlier when I was literally fumbling. She'd chosen someone that she felt like she could feel tired around and herself for the first time in her life. I feel like this, this video has been me figuring out my own head. Um, 
I'm not going to move on for this relationship for a while. To be fair, it's only been like a month. So I'm not going to like be too hard on myself about the fact that I'm still very much obsessed with them. Obviously, I wanted to emphasize the fact that they were a great couple, regardless of the fact that it is queer representation. But at the same time, I want to emphasize the fact that it is queer representation. I'm not, I mean, I haven't consumed that much queer media, but I do know that most of the gay love stories I see are usually, if they are at least somewhat chirpy, they're usually men. And so I think that that was very special and I don't think it should be ignored because I know that, and again, Victoria and Amelia in interviews are emphasizing this, they're like, you know, regardless of the fact that it is queer representation, it's great. Yeah, but it's still queer representation. That's still really great because we don't have enough of it in film and TV, even though it is 2020. And Mike Flanagan being, uh, I believe, straight man. I know he's married to Kate Siegel, which like, could have been me. I mean, it couldn't have been me. I'm like, uh, many years younger than her. Uh, that's the reason it couldn't be me, right? Okay, I'm gonna shut up. Um, I have made two other Bly Manor videos. So I will link them in the description if you want to go watch them. The first one was a reaction to the final episode and the second one was an analysis of the exploration of life and death in Bly Manor. So yeah, thank you for watching. Please join me in the comment section for just crying and more crying. I'll see you next time, pals. I'm so I don't, I don't know what's going on.